right, good morning, everybody. And before we do anything else, it has been quite a while since I have given you a wonderful dad joke, okay? So I don't know, you write this one down. You can use this all week. Uh, and it goes like this. What do you call a bad noodle? An impasta. Absolutely. Yes. You know that was better than what you're laughing about. Yes, it was. My favorite thing about my dad jokes is the look of disgust on all of your faces. That is my favorite. Uh, inside, or not inside your worship guide, I say that a lot. Uh, on your seat, there was this thing right here. And if you don't know what that is, make sure you know that it has got a picture of our next series coming up in three weeks called our At The Movie Series. And I tell you all the time that when we have a series that you definitely want to invite your unsafe friends and family to, I'll let you know. And this is definitely one of those series. We have more people who give their lives to Christ during those four weeks than we do any other time of the year. And the reason why is because we use modern day parables, uh, what we call movies, just like Jesus did. We use modern day parables to tell the story of the gospel. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this year we're going to take some chances. We're going to take some risks. We're going to do any, everything short of sin to try to reach people for Jesus. Because there's some hard-hitting topics that's happening in our culture right now. And so we're not going to shy away from those. We're going to talk about some of those because we want to help some people. And so I'm just excited about this series. It's going to be amazing. So I want you to go to as many of your, uh, of your friends and family who don't know Jesus. Give them one of these cards. And I've got more. So if you need more of them, just let us know. And you just tell them, we're going to watch a movie. That's going to be free popcorn, free soda. What's not to love, right? I mean, it's, it's going to be absolutely great. So make sure not only that you plan to be here for that, but you let everybody know because I, that's why I actually take a moment and tell you because I love seeing people get saved. And we have more people that give their lives to Christ during those four weeks than any other time. We actually had 15 people one year get saved watching the movie Elf. Figure that out. I don't know. <laughs> all right. But all I know is as long as Jesus keeps using it, we're going to keep doing it, okay? All right, so make sure you've got that. Let's put that to the side for now. And I want you to get out your message notes because we're going to jump right into the first part of a series I've been really excited about called Being Rich at What Matters Most. And, and this is part of an annual series, an annual time of the year that we just kind of take everything else, put it to the side, and we focus on what God has to say about finances, because God has a lot of great things to say about finances, on how you can be free, how you don't have to be worried and full of anxiety when it comes to your finances. And, and so if, if God has a lot of great things to say about finances, shouldn't we take some time and see what he has to say about this topic? And so that's what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to talk about God's viewpoint on how to be free in our finances, on how to be rich in what matters most. And I need to go ahead and give you a disclaimer as we run into this, and that is that we really do two different kind of message series around here. Uh, and one of them is like, well, we'll have a theme, but then every single message kind of stands on its own, right? So you could, you could attend one message for the whole series and you kind of get the point, right? You could do that. Then we have other kind of series that every service builds on itself. And so the, the last service will build on for the next one and you kind of understand. That's what this kind of series is. So like today, we're not going to answer all the questions you will ever have about godly finances. We're going to set a foundation for what we're going to build on for the rest of our time together. So you want to make sure, it's only a three-week series, you want to make sure you're here every week so you can hear what we are talking about because God has some amazing promises in his word when it comes to finances. And for some of us, this is a great time of the year to kind of course correct. Because as the year goes on, we kind of get in some, some unhealthy thinking when it comes to finances. We get full of anxiety and fear and stress. And this is just a time to kind of go, wait a minute, this is what God says about finances. It's all good, all right? So that's, that's what my hope is, is that it encourages you and it fills you full of life, all right? All right, now that you know all that, I want to ask you a question. And I want you to kind of play along with me. You ready? Here it goes. When you were a kid, how many of you used to dream about being rich? Can see? Can you play? You used to dream about it, right? Like you were going to win the lottery, you were going to be a professional ball player. You were, you know, you were, you were going to, I don't know, you know, be a rock star, rob a bank. You're going to do something, right? And, and how many had at least one friend that you thought was rich and you thought one day I'm going to be like them? Any of those people? Like for me, it was a friend of mine who had a Nintendo, okay? Because I had an Atari. How many know, how many's old enough remember what those things are, right? And I loved my Atari until I saw his Nintendo, 
And he wasn't just awesome with that Nintendo. He had the little pad thing you could step on. You could run real fast, you know, and jump, you know, that kind of thing. I was like, this guy can play Nintendo with his feet. He is so loaded. I mean, and my goal in life was to get the pad thing so I could run real fast and jump. And then I knew all my hopes and dreams had come to pass, right? It was, it was amazing. So we all had these dreams when we were kids. Now let me ask this question. How many now that you were adult have realized your dream? You are filthy, ugly, ridiculously wealthy. We used to, like we say in Alabama, I am just stupid rich. How many of you guys, anybody, ushers, pay attention. Ushers, please pay very close attention. Nobody. Okay. All right. Well, I want to tell you, there was actually a time in my life when I felt ridiculous, disgustingly, filthy rich. Okay. I'm going to tell you about this time. I was 16 years old. And I had just got through working my first full week at the very high class establishment called McDonald's. Okay. I was working there and I was a burger flipper. And it turns out a colorblind guy doesn't need to be handling raw, you know, hamburger meat, but we found that out later. But at the time, I had worked a full week and I got my first paycheck. And I didn't even wait till I got to my car. I ripped that thing open, I looked at it, and there were three digits. On the right side, the left side, you know, on the, on the good side of the decimal, I made, I'll never forget it, $103. Show me the money, man. Come on now. I had no idea what to do with that much money. You got to understand, my car payment was $100 a month. It took $18 to fill up my gas tank. Everybody got free lunch and it was all on Brandon. I'm telling you, I had no idea. I went home and asked my dad, Dad, what do I do with all this money? Guess I need a checking account. And he just laughed and said, you'll figure it out, son. It'll be all right. You know? And that was the first and honestly last time I ever felt quite that wealthy. But for like a moment, I thought, man, I am blessed and highly favored. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Don't look at me because I got it going on. You know what I'm saying? $103. Have you ever felt like that? <laughs> well, we all want to feel like that, but the honest truth is most of us haven't. We, we want to be rich. We want to be wealthy, but if we're honest, we don't feel that way. And it's a shame because God has a lot of promises in his word for people who fit that description. And maybe you're going, well, that's great, but I don't. Well, the series scripture actually applies to people who are rich. It says it like this. It says, tell those who are rich in the world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and obsessed with money. Thank you very much. Which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them actually to go after God who piles on all the riches that we could ever manage and to do good to be rich in helping others, and to be extravagantly generous. In other words, saying, hey, all these people who've got just, just rolling in it, just make sure they understand how to have a proper perspective of finances because there's a promise. If they can do that, they're actually going to build up a treasury that will last, and they're going to gain life that is truly life. In other words, they're going to know what real life really is. They're going to understand what it is to really live. If they can just get a proper perspective, all these rich people get a proper perspective on finances. To which some of you are going, well, great. When I find a rich person, I'll let them know. Thank you for telling me what promises don't apply to me, right? Because if, once again, if we're honest, most of us in this room probably don't feel like that you are rich. And the reason why is because it's subjective, isn't it? Like, like there's not an actual number that people, you know, say, okay, well, if you have this amount, you're wealthy. If not, you don't, all right? Like, like, for instance, there's no such thing as a rich line, okay? Like, everything below this, you are pitiful, poor, and broke. And above this, you got it going on, all right? That, that, that doesn't exist. But they, it does for different people, depending on your context. Like, like uh, Gallup poll did a, did a study a few years ago, and they asked people, they were looking for the, the, the rich line. And they, they asked people who had a net income, or a household income, rather, of $30,000 a year, and they said, where's the rich line? Like, what, how much money would you need to make before you consider yourself to be wealthy? And, and they said majority around $74,000. They said, uh, excuse me, $65,000. 65. If I had that much money, I would be wealthy. Okay, well, maybe that's the rich line. Well, then they went to people who made $50,000, a little more. How much would you need in order to kind of cross that line and be wealthy? They said, well, I'd have to have around 100000 So the, the line had moved. And so they were like, well, there's got to be a top end to this. So they went to what they call the top earners in, in the U.S., people who made 200000 and more a year, and they said, 
what do you think you would have to have in order to be, you know, get above the line and be wealthy? And they said, oh, that's easy. If I had around $5 million in the bank, I would be wealthy. To which I say, well, yeah, <laughs> you, know, you have $5 million in the bank. The problem is there's some poor guy who's only got a measly $2 million and thinks he's broke. <laughs> you know? No, he's not. But the thing is, is the line is always moving all these different places. And so the reality is, is we need to figure out what it is to be wealthy, what it is to be rich, so then we can learn to, to be rich in what matters the most because that line is always moving. So to kind of course correct us a little bit, we're going to build a foundation today, and I want to give you some good news and some bad news that we're going to build on. How many would like to hear the good news first? Want to hear the good news first, right? How many, how many would like to hear the bad news first? The bad news first? Too bad. It's in my notes to do good news first. We're going to do good news, all right? Here, here's the good news if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, write this down, all right? Here's the good news, and that is you are rich. Look at your neighbor and say, you must not know about me, all right? You, you, you didn't know? Look at somebody else and say, you didn't know? You, you didn't realize I was loaded? Right. Yeah, I, I know some of that makes you feel uncomfortable, all right? We're going somewhere with this. But the good news is that you, you apply, all right? And, and let's make sure we have a healthy definition of what the word rich is. Here's the definition. Rich is blessed beyond what I need, all right? It's like I've got everything I need, and i got more on top of that. That is someone who is rich. That, that's, that is the definition. And, and so that what that means is, is whether you feel like it or not, for everybody in here, can I just go ahead and put us all in the same category? We are so very blessed beyond what we need, which means then, whether you like to admit it or not, you are rich. And that makes people feel uncomfortable. They don't want to say that. They want to be holy and pious and praise the Lord. No, I'm not. Yes, I've got four cars and two boats, but I'm not, I'm not blessed. God's just kind of just been, you know, whatever. The Bible actually says that when God gives someone wealth and possessions and then the ability to use them, that's a gift from God. It's like it's all his, and he lets you have it. Wow. Praise the Lord for that. I mean, like, like why, why do you feel so bad about that? Instead, you should be very, very grateful because every blessing that we're not grateful for can turn into pride. We start thinking that we earned it somehow or we did it. No, no, everything we have comes from God. No, no, pastor, I earned that. I, I worked hard for that. I, I, I did all. Well, yeah, but where do you think your strength came from? Where do you think your job came from? Where do you think your life came from? And then God gave you that and allowed you to be blessed. It's all from him. And it's a gift from him. And so we shouldn't be ashamed of how God has blessed us. Instead, we should celebrate it. But once again, the pushback I can literally feel coming on me is there's no way I'm blessed because I got some significant financial issues. Like, Pastor, if you knew the financial issues I have, you would not call me rich. You would not call me blessed. And you may be right, because in the context, kind of the fishbowl of your current demographic and your current culture, you may not be as blessed as whatever that imaginary line is that you're trying to reach for. Because remember, it doesn't really exist. There's this idea we all have that I get to this one place somewhere, somehow, and I'll be blessed. But the, the reality is, is you'll never actually get to that place. And so in your reality, you may not feel blessed, but if you were to broaden your perspective just a little bit, like over the course of the world, you might begin to realize just how blessed you really are. And I want to say this with all respect. I'm not in any way trying to downplay any kind of financial situation you're going through. But I want to tell you that there are people in this world who would love to have your financial crisis because they don't even come close to starting where you're at right now. And you may not believe me, but, but I want to go ahead and kind of tell you this. Like, like right now, like right, right now, there are people who have no idea about the kind of lifestyle that you live. They've seen it on TV, but they don't know. And, and right now, somewhere in the world, it's, it's almost dark, somewhere and there's a grandfather who's gathering up all his grandkids. He's gathering them up all around the fire. Come on, kids, come on. It's story time. Yay, it's story time. Grandfather's going to tell us a story. Tonight, it's going to be a true story. Oh, I love true stories are my favorite. It's like, tonight, I'm going to tell you how to recognize a rich person in the wild. All right? So if you see a rich person, you'll know that's a rich person. Okay, grandfather, tell me what it is to see a rich person. What is it? Okay, okay, you're not going to believe this. But some people in this world are so rich, and maybe you've seen these people too, they're so rich, grandkids, that they actually own a car. Because, <gasps> you know, two-thirds of the world don't own one. You're already in the, in the last third if you actually own one. They own, a car. they own their own car? Yeah, you know, some people are so ridiculously, as we say in Alabama, stupid rich, that they own two cars. <gasps> they have two cars? Yes, they do. And guess what? 
only do they have two cars, but they build houses for their cars. They call those cars, or those houses, garages. They have buttons, and you hit the button, and the door comes up, and the door, really? Yes, and some people are so blessed that they've got cars, and they've got garages, but they can't fit their cars in the garages because it's got all their stuff in the, in the garages. That's how, no way, grandfather, yes way. It is so true. That's how rich some people are. Tell us more, grandfather. I've got one word for you, grandkids. You know what that is? Gather around, kids. It's called upgrades. What's an upgrade, grandfather? They can take a perfectly good cell phone and walk into a store and say, I don't like this one anymore. Give me a new one. Give me a new one. Well, grandfather, was the old one broken? No, it wasn't broken. It just wasn't shiny enough. <laughs> it wasn't pretty enough. It didn't have the new phone on it. it they, they wanted a new one. And they just went, uh, oh, give me a new one. And they gave them a new one. That's how rich they are. Some people are so rich, they don't actually give them their old one. They keep the old one and put it in a drawer somewhere until they eventually throw it away. <laughs> and then there are parents who give those to their kids. That's, wow. Not only that, but guess what? Some people are so rich that they have more food than they can eat in a full day, and so they put it in a refrigerator. Grandfather, what is a refrigerator? It keeps things cold until they eat it later, but unfortunately, most people don't get to it. They have more food in their refrigerator than they can eat, so eventually it ruins and starts to smell bad, and so they throw it away. you got to be kidding me. That is rich. Not only that, but they do this thing called yard sales when they get really tired of all their stuff, and so they make other people come and buy it, which means they have more money for stuff they would have thrown away anyway. That is amazing. And then guess what? This is the kicker, kids, that every morning they get up and they go into this room that's bigger than our house called a closet. They look over all their clothes and then look at their spouse and declare, I have nothing to wear. Oh my goodness. And it's at that point with all the grandkids around and the grandfather's talking to them that they start laughing and go, ah, grandfather, you're not taking your medicine. You done gone crazy. Nobody lives like that. It's true. I saw it on TV. And they just run off and start laughing and don't believe him because for 3 billion people all over the planet live on less than $2 a day. Oh my goodness. If I were to have $2 right now and say, who wants it? Y'all be like, I don't get up for less than a 20. All right. Yeah. You know why? Because we're so blessed and we don't even realize it. We're, we're so very, I know in your world, you may not feel like that you are blessed beyond measure, but if you look at over the course of the world, they can't hardly get their mind around how you struggle to go to a restaurant once a month. They're like, what? People make you food and you got to wait like 10 minutes to get it? Whoa, you know? And I'm not trying to make you feel, but I'm just trying to open your eyes to go, oh my goodness. Get out of the rat race that our culture demands that you have to achieve something before you're very blessed. No, no, you're already so very blessed. You know, as a matter of fact, there is some research that said that if you make $30,000, you have an income, household income of $30,000, you are in 1%, top 1% of wage earners in the entire world. $30,000. How about this? If your household income exceeds that of $88,000, you are in 0.1% of the highest wage earners in the entire world. Look at your neighbor and say, 1%er right here. 1%er. You didn't know about me. I'm in the 1%, all right? I'm in the 1%. I, I got it, all right? Show me the money. I got this going. What am I trying to tell you? As I'm trying to tell you this, and you have to understand this because the truth of the reality is, is that God has blessed us with more than we need. We are rich. There are people all over the world, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Please don't take it this way. I just want to open your eyes to something you should be very grateful for. There are people all over the world who would love to have to clip coupons and have your life. <laughs> There are people who would love to have to worry about your financial issues. And that's not in any way to downplay the severity of it. I'm just saying, on your worst day, you're living so much better than three-fourths of the entire world. You know you live in the most prosperous nation in the history of the world? You are so very blessed. And it's, there's two reasons why you need to realize that it's good news that you are rich, you're blessed. You know why? One it's because some of us have been spending too much of our life trying to reach the line that we're never going to reach. And so we've been, we've been trying to do everything we can do, everything we can do to somehow finally get to this line. And then now I'll be happy. Now I'll have enough finances. Now everything will make sense. And you know what happens is that line moves. 
You'll never get there. There's never a moment that you're finally going to be satisfied. But instead, if you start to realize you're already blessed, that starts to make a difference. The truth is, the secret to having everything in life is to realize you already do. To realize you're already blessed more than you can imagine. That doesn't mean you don't stop trying to do the best you can to provide for your family and all that. That doesn't mean, I'm just saying, stop acting like you aren't already blessed. Because the second reason why we need to realize we're blessed is if we're honest, there's some of us even in this room who's a little bit bitter at God because you don't think he's been faithful. Because you've been trying to serve him, you've been trying to be faithful to him, and you kind of say this, you don't say it out loud, but somewhere inside your mind you go, you know what, God, I don't know if I can really trust you because you haven't blessed me. Not the way I thought you should. But if we actually stopped and looked, you are blessed and highly favored. Just the fact that you wake up in the United States of America, you are blessed and you are so very rich in your life. That's the good news, is that you are rich. Now, the foundation of the next part is I've got some bad news. Remember I had good news that you're rich, you're in the one percenter club, God has blessed you and it's a blessing from God. Here's the bad news and that is this. The bad news is you are rich. <laughs> that is not a typo, but it is a double-edged sword because on one side you are blessed and God is for you and not against you and that is amazing, but the bad side is, is the very thing that God has blessed you with can be used as your greatest enemy. And for some of us, that's why we need a course correction. That's why once a year we need to come back and talk about godly finances because it starts to become an unhealthy thing in our life. And instead of drawing us closer to God, it draws us further away from him. And so we have to have a season when we course correct and remember what it's really all about because it can be the very best thing in your life or it can derail your relationship with God. This actually happened in the ministry of Jesus. There was a time when Jesus was, uh, it's called the, the story of the rich young ruler, but Jesus was teaching. And, and one day he's teaching, we don't know exactly what all he was saying, but, but while he was teaching, this, this young, very wealthy guy comes up and interrupts him. So maybe Jesus is talking about the Beatitudes, you know, and blessed are the poor for they show, you know, and then he's like, hey, hey, Jesus. And then Jesus is kind of like, okay, hey, yes, <laughs> what can I do for you? Interrupt, sir, you know, what, what can I do for you? And he's like, hey, what do I need to do? You see how entitled this guy is. He interrupts Jesus to ask his own question. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? In other words, all this stuff you're saying, what do I need to do to make it into the kingdom of God? What do I need to do? And Jesus is like, I mean, you can almost see him kind of going, I mean, I hope you were listening. I mean, you need to obey what I've put in God. You need to obey God's word. You need to do, do the things you're supposed to do. And he interrupts Jesus again. And he's like, nah, man. I've been doing all that since I was a baby. I got this stuff figured out. He's just, just so satisfied in his riches, so satisfied in what God had blessed him with. And the Bible says Jesus looked at him, and he wasn't mad at him. He loved him. He realized he really does do so much right. But he's got this one blind spot in his life that's derailing everything. And so he looked at him, and he said, do you want to really be part of the kingdom of God? you want to be part of my squad? <laughs> Then I want you to go take all the stuff you've got, I want you to sell it, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Now, it's the only time in the Bible that Jesus asked anybody to do that, so I'm not saying that he's going to ask you to do that, but he understood this was a stumbling block for this young man. And the Bible said that that guy looked at Jesus, and then he walked away, and he didn't do it. Because he realized, Jesus realized that was his stumbling block. What God had blessed him with had become his greatest distraction from being able to honor God in his life. And it broke, it broke his heart. As a matter of fact, as he's walking away and Jesus sees this man walking away, he says this, he says, how hard it is for the rich, remember that's me and that's you, to enter into the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. What? <laughs> That's ridiculous. I mean, can you see that? Like, like a big, old, ugly camel going through. You ever seen the eye of a needle? Can I just say it's small, okay? It's really, really, really small. It's where you, you have to like, you know, we used to you have to, to, to lick the thread to make it kind of go through the needle. And he's saying that this big, old, ugly camel is going to have to go through this little bitty needle. And, and that's, that's how easy it is. Now, that's not, that's not hard, that's impossible, okay? That, I mean, let's just be honest. That, that's not, that's not, unless you had the world's biggest needle, and even then I don't think it's going to work, it's just not going to happen. It's impossible. So is Jesus saying, no, that's impossible? It is impossible for someone who I have blessed? Because remember, all riches come from him. So it's impossible for someone I've blessed to make it to heaven? No, not really. First of all, he's saying it's going to take a miracle. You can't do it by yourself. Second of all, is there's some historical evidence, and they're actually still studying this, but there's, there's a chance that Jesus meant something 
a little bit deeper that if you study it and you, you study the culture of the time, you can understand a, a deeper meaning. And that is that there were several gates around the city of Jerusalem. And most of these gates were huge where you could, you could walk 10 to 15 people wide to get through these gates. But there were some smaller ones. And there was one that was only about six feet tall and about four feet wide. It was very, very small. And it actually had a nickname and it was called the Eye of a Needle because it was so very small compared to all the rest of them. And what Jesus very well could have been saying is he said, have you ever watched a camel go through that really small gate over there? <laughs> it's not impossible. It's really hard. And they did some research to see what it would take for a camel to go through one of those. And what they actually would have to do is they could get through it, but they'd have to get down on, all, on, on their knees. And the camel don't want to do that. It's, it feels very, very claustrophobic, so it would resist against that. So they'd have to put a blindfold over the camel's eyes so it would cause it to relax. And then a trusted leader would pull on the reins and talk to it the entire way. So it would say, come on, it's going to be okay. No, 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 don't get up. Because once it got underneath that gateway, if it stood up, it would break its back and they'd have to kill it. So they have to stay on his knees and a trusted voice would lead it blind going through going, it's okay. You can trust me. It's going to be all right. I know this doesn't feel comfortable right now. I know you'd rather do it another way, but this is the way to go. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay until he got on the other side, and then he would get him up. Is it possible what Jesus is saying? Is it's not impossible for someone who is wealthy, someone who has been blessed in this world to make it to heaven, but it's going to take them being humble and letting me lead them through some uncomfortable places, some places that maybe they'd rather go an easier way. But if you really want to be part of the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to listen to me, and you're going to have to follow my voice and do it my way. Otherwise, it could destroy you. Is that what Jesus was trying to say? I think maybe possibly. Because the good news is, is all of us in here, maybe not compared to whoever it is you're comparing yourself to. Maybe you don't feel rich. But the reality is you are. But with that comes blind spots. There's three major blind spots to being so very blessed in this life. And I want to give them to you really quickly before we pray. And my hope for you over the course of this series is we will course correct and just like that camel having to get down on his knees and being led by the voice of a trusted leader, that we can get down on our knees spiritually and say, Jesus, I want you to lead me so that I can be blessed and prosper in every way. But we got to understand these blind spots. And here's the first one. The first blind spot is that it is harder for you to depend on God because you are so very blessed. It really is. I mean, Jesus was teaching his disciples one time. They, they asked him, can you teach us how to pray? And he said, okay, pray like this. And at one point he actually says, He's praying and saying, God, give us today our daily bread. In other words, we don't have anything, so we're asking you to help us make it through today. Now, let me ask this question. Reality, when is the last time you sat at a table and said, God, if you don't feed me today, I'm going to die? Can I just be honest? Unless you're in college right now, probably not recently, okay? <laughs> now, if you're a college student in here, never mind, all right? But for the rest of us, it's been a while. You know Why? Because let's just be really honest and understand the heart when I'm trying to say this, okay? I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just trying to help you understand. You don't see this in your life. I don't see it in my life. That's why we got we to course correct. I don't depend on God for my bread. You know why? Because it's in my cabinet. Well, God provided you the money. to. Yeah, he did. But what I'm saying is because he's already blessed me, I don't have to sit at my table and go, okay, God, I'm not going to be able to feed my kids dinner unless you do something. You know why? Because he's already blessed me so very much. And so, so sometimes I can struggle to truly trust God for areas because I'm not used to it. I'm not used to having to. You know why? Because we pray for God to give us promotion, give us a raise at work, give us more vacation days to help us have more than what we want. We really want that iPhone 11 upgrade, and we don't know we don't need it. We, we pray for that. But when's the last time you say, God, if you don't come through today, I will die tomorrow? We're so very blessed that it keeps us from being able to depend on God. I went on a missions trip not long ago, and after I got back, I outlawed, all right, like, like outlawed saying the phrase, I'm starving at my house, all right, because I had never saw somebody truly starving, like in person, until I went there. And I went there, and I met some people that if they didn't eat within a couple of days, they were going to die. It, was, it, it broke my heart. And then I get home, and my two girls are looking at me, and they don't want what's in the cabinet. They want to go out to eat at Wendy's. And so they say, Dad, let's go eat. I'm starving. I started crying. I said, you are never allowed to say you are starving again, or I'm going to help you understand what that word actually means. <laughs> because you are not starving. You know, you know why? They've never known what it is to truly, they've known what it is to not want to eat something. They've never known what it is to not have something. And for many of us, we got to course correct, because we're so very blessed that it's become difficult for us to really depend on God. We ask God to, to bless us. Why don't we ask him to sustain us? So we got a course correct because it's not always good news. 
that we're blessed because it creates it creates a blind spot. The second blind spot that we're going to fix throughout this so we can be free to have life that's truly life is, number two, is that it distracts us from true priorities. It, tr it distracts us from what really matters in our life. You know why? Because we're so very blessed. Isn't that true? We're so very blessed. Once again, God has blessed us so very much that it distracts us from what we used to realize were priorities. Like, as an example, like the Bible says in Hebrews, it says to, you know, to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. In other words, it says, that means go to church. Go be around other Christ followers. Go worship together. Go read God's word together. Do what we do here. Do, do that, right? That's a true priority. As a Christ follower, we need to be in God's house. Do you know the average American Christian attends church twice a month? Why? Because they're so very busy managing God's blessings. They've got kids who are in travel ball and all this other kind of stuff, and they got vacations they got to take, and, and they got to go to the lake house and fix all that kind of stuff up, and they got all this other stuff. No, I'm not putting any of that down. I'm just saying that we, we, we go, you know what? I, I can't go honor God because I'm busy managing what he's already blessed me with. That is ridiculous, but it's what we do because we've gotten so used to the blessings of God. God's, God's word talks about being in Christian community. So around here at Real Life Church, we, can, we think being in a life group is super important. You need a place to, where you can know people and be known, someone to pray for you all the time, someone to walk with you through difficult situations. But every time I talk to people who don't go to a life group, you know what their number one excuse is? I'm too busy. Absolutely. You know what you're busy doing? Managing what God's already blessed you with. No, I'm not. I'm working. Well, where do you think the job came from? <laughs> from him. You're so very blessed, and you're so busy managing his blessings that you neglect true priorities. How about one more? God's word says that we are to give to him. It talks about a tithe, 10%. There's a spiritual blessing attached to honoring God, that when you honor him, says you keep 90 and be blessed, give me 10. Not because I need your money. It all belongs to me anyway. I want to test your heart. I want to see if I really am number one. Are you willing to give me 10% to prove to me to, to, that I can trust you with more blessings? And this, So there's a, a promise attached to it. But so many people don't give. You know why? Because I can't give to God and continue to have all that I want. And so we don't honor God because we're so busy managing our blessings. Some of us need to course correct. Not, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just saying, how far are you off from true north? And if you're, not, if you're off, let's fix it because God wants to bless you. He doesn't want you to keep running after that imaginary line you're not going to find anyway. He wants you free of stress and anxiety and all those bad things that comes with putting the wrong attention on your finances. He wants you to be free and to love him and to understand you do your best and God always does the rest. But you got to first get your priorities right. And then the third one, the, the blind spot, is that it means we have a greater responsibility. God's word says too much is given, much is required. And you and I are so very blessed. But can I tell you that God, God wants you blessed. Okay, that's not what this series is. God, God is no problem with you being blessed because, I mean, think about everything you have, he gave you. So it's not like he's not wanting you blessed. No, 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 it's not it. But he didn't bless you so you could be spoiled. He blessed you so you could be a blessing. That, yeah, enjoy what I've given you. Enjoy it, my goodness. But what, what else are you doing with it? How are you investing in it? And over the course of this series, we're going to talk about how we're going to go from looking at a greater responsibility that we're going to realize we have a greater opportunity to use what God has given us to make a difference. And so as we end our time today, I'm so excited about the rest of this series because we're going to build on this. And I, I truly have been praying for you for weeks now that God was going to set some of us free. And we're going to be excited in this area that, that by the time this series is over with, you're not going to be like, oh, Lord, they're talking about money at church. No, no, you're going to be excited because we're going to get some freedom in this area. And you're going to have more joy than you've ever had. But this, it starts off with realizing that you're rich. That the promises of God apply to you. So I want to read that, that opening promise again. But this time, I want you to put your name in there. And since I'm up here, I'll put my name. And it says this, tell Brandon to quit being so full of himself. Thank you, Jesus. Appreciate that. And so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. So quit obsessing about that rich line. And if I could just cross it. So he says, hey, don't do that. I'll be part of that rat race. You're never going to get there. Don't so stop that. Instead, tell Brandon to go after me. Because I'm the one who gives you everything you have anyway. Do good, be rich in helping others, and be extravagantly generous. If Brandon will do that, he will build a treasury that will last, gaining a life that is truly life. And what that promise is saying is saying this. It's saying if you can gain a healthy view of blessings, 
you can gain life that is truly life. And I will tell you, I need series like this. Because I'm like you in the fact that if I'm not careful, I try to use finances to fill the void that only God can fill. I try to use finances for self-worth, security, who I think I am and how far I've made it in life. All that stuff, that's, that's what God's supposed to feel. But I try to use my finances to find my self-worth. And the problem is, is that it's never enough. So every once in a while, I need to course correct. I need to remember where the source of my strength really comes from. It doesn't come from what God has given me. It comes from who He is. And in here, maybe, maybe you've, you've gotten off your course just a little bit. Maybe you've gotten to the place where you have an unhealthy view of your finances. And you, you, you have an unhealthy, and that you can tell because of how stressed out you are about it. I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned, but if it's keeping you up at night, I think you might have forgotten who's in charge of it. And that you do the best you can and let God do what only he can. And if that's you, I want to help you, just like I'm helping myself, remember who's really in charge. Because there's one thing that I know that I think about all the time, and that is this. And that is that one day, and I hope it's a long time for all of us, we're all going to die. <laughs> well, Pastor, I wish you'd be more positive. All right, I am positive you're going to die. Okay, <laughs> you know, there is a one out of one chance you're not getting out of this thing alive. Okay, it's going to happen. I hope it's a long time. But one day, we're going to stand before God. And according to God's word, I don't know exactly how he's going to say this, but somehow or another, he's going to ask us two questions. The first question he's going to ask us is, what did you do with Jesus? Like he came to this earth he took the, the penalty for your sin. You had, all you had to do is receive that. What did you do? And that's the only one that matters on getting into heaven. And your answer needs to be, I received that sacrifice for my salvation. That's, that's what that answer has to be. Okay, if you did that, you go to heaven. But he's going to ask a second question not everybody thinks about. That has nothing to do with getting to heaven, but it does have to do with the rewards, how you are blessed. And I don't know exactly how he's going to say this, but he's basically going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? Like, you, from the parents you came from, the gifts, talents, abilities, you were alive in the 21st century, the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, blessed beyond measure, whether you realize it or not, what'd you do with it? Did you use it to get yourself ahead? I'm glad you did. Yeah, good. Be blessed. But did you use it all for you? Or did you use it to make a difference? And I want to tell you, there's been times in my life well, I, I would have answered really well for how I served, how I tried to help people and lead people. And I, I felt confident I was doing well in that area, but I, I wouldn't have been real confident if he asked me, what did you do with your finances? I would have been ashamed. That's why I need series like this. Is one day I want to get to heaven. And when God asks me, what did you do? I want to say, you know what? God, I didn't get it right all the time. But I kept course correcting. I kept course correcting. And I did the very best I could to both enjoy what you gave me, but then make a difference in the lives of other people. And by the time this series is over with, I hope we all are back at that place where one day we can stand before God and we say, you know what, God, I didn't get it right all the time. I had to constantly course correct, constantly course correct. But God, you helped me to make a difference. And now I give it back to you as an act of worship. Let's pray together today. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your blessings and your mercy. Lord, thank you for your kindness. Lord, thank you for the honor that I feel as a pastor to be able to share your word about an area that the enemy has tried to deceive us in for so long. He's tried to keep the topic of finances out of your church. But God, we're going to have a healthy view so that we can honor you. And I pray you will speak to our hearts. You'll move in our lives. Lord, I believe there are people in this room that they are more bound up and worried and upset over their finances than they are any other area of their life. I pray over the course of this series, God, you will set us free. But let us run straight to you and understand what life truly is because we trust you. Right now, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. I don't know, maybe you're in a place right now where you're so very blessed and you know it. And your prayer right now just simply needs to be a prayer of gratitude. Thank you, God, for all you're doing in my life. Thank you so much. But maybe you're in a place right now that if you're honest, your idea of godly finances is not at true north. 
it's time to course correct a little bit. Or maybe you're in a significant financial situation. And while you're, you're with me and you say, you know what, yes, I'm blessed, but man, I still got this situation. Maybe you just need to pray right now and ask God, God, will you speak to me today and over the next couple of weeks? Give me the wisdom that I need to make the right decisions so that I can trust you, so that I can be set free from this worry and this anxiety. I just want to give you a moment between you and the Lord because I truly believe there's nothing quite like financial pain because we put so much on it when really our trust needs to be in Jesus. So I just want to give you that moment just between you and the Lord just to have that conversation. God, I just give it to you as best I can and just give you permission to speak to me. And while you're doing that, I want to talk to maybe somebody else. And if you're honest, you were doing fine in this message until I said one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to ask you, what did you do with Jesus? Jesus came to this earth. He paid the price you couldn't pay to wash away your sins. And all you have to do is receive it. You can't earn salvation, you receive it. And in that moment, when I said that, you, you realize, you know what, I've, I've not done that. I've, I've never really let him wash away my sins. Or maybe you're in a place right now where there was a time when you walked with God, but you, you've kind of walked away from your relationship with him. And if you're honest, you really don't know where you stand with God right now. Can I tell you, as I always do, God's not mad at you. He's not offended at you. He's not vengeful toward you. He's in love with you. And maybe the only reason you're here in this place right now is so that you could be told one more time that he has not given up on you. And that if you can pray right now, and you can ask him to make you right with him, all those sins can be washed away. I don't care if you prayed that prayer before, today could be your day. Today could be the day that it goes from being a head knowledge to a heart experience. And if that's you, I want to lead you in this prayer. And if you can believe it in your heart, he wants to set you free today. Say it with me like this. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Right now, Jesus, come into my life. Wash away all my sin. I come to you just as I am. Take all of me. And from this day forward, I will live for you all of my days. In Jesus' name. Now, God, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, those who prayed that prayer. Lord, I just pray right now that you will go on the inside of them. You'll do what we can't do for ourselves. You will wash away that sin. Make us new and whole and clean from the inside out. Lord, let us not just know about your love, but experience it for ourselves. And right now, Lord, I speak a blessing over this day and over this series that as we begin to course correct in our life and we begin to remember how faithful you are and remember how to honor you in our finances, God, that you will breathe wind into ourselves. Help us, Lord. Lord, to have life that is truly life. Bring joy back to this area of our life. And we're going to be so careful. Give you all the praise and all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the message today and God spoke to you in a special way. And if you did enjoy this message, please consider subscribing. Also, liking the content as well as sharing with other people. If we can ever do anything for you, please visit our website, experiencerlc.com or email us at info at experiencerlc.com.